<laughs> well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We live in uh, interesting times. <clears throat> it's the eclipse's fault. That's right. The apocalypse. I don't know. Like, I'm expecting total chaos and wide shutdown of services. And if not, then people have been making a big deal. <laughs> you know. But uh, this is not like this. This happened, anyways. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. We're um, continuing our series this morning about the life of Joseph, entitled God With Us. And uh, today we're going to talk about the, the latter portion of his story, and we'll see if we get all the way through. Um, if we don't, we, we might give it one more go. But I wanted to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 42. We ended up with Joseph going through his mistreatment at the hands of his brothers, his uh, slavery at, in Potiphar's house, and then false accusation by Potiphar's wife that lands him in prison, and then he interprets the dream of the baker and the cupbearer and, uh, and asks them to remember them when, when God does what he's so, said in the dream, and of course, the cupbearer who lives forgets about him, and finally, eventually, we get the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream, and Joseph is uh, exalted to a position second only to the Pharaoh. And that's kind of where we left off. And uh, so we've been talking about the life of Joseph, and we're about to come full circle and come back to family. So let's pick up in Genesis chapter 42. And I want to read a good, we're going to read most of the story this morning, and I'll have a stop and think. When Jacob, the father, learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? He said, behold, I've heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So it's apparently gotten pretty dire, and I would love to, given this family, I mean, if you've followed the, the family dynamics here, and you read between the lines, you know, we get little conversations in Scripture, Jacob and Esau, and then now Jacob's the father, and he has his 12 sons, and one of whom is presumed dead because the other 10 have, were originally going to kill him and then decided instead they'll just sell him into slavery. So when he says, why do you look at one another? Like, obviously, they're at the point of starvation. They're at the point where they don't have food, and Jacob is telling them, we've got to go find food or we're going to die. So there's got to be more going on than... I would love to know what was behind that. Why do you look at one another? Are they arguing? Are they fighting? Are they worried? But... You know, we know this story, so I think we forget. This, this is, is it's critical. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Benjamin, of course, being the other son of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now, Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and, bought and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. Now, about 13 years have passed between the last time he saw his brothers and now. He was 17, 18, somewhere right around that age of uh, adulthood, and now he's in his 30s. Joseph is dressed in the finest linens of Egypt, the, the decked out in gold. He is second to Pharaoh, so he had a coat of many colors, which was the envy of his brothers, but now he's so far beyond what he was then, as Brother Gossett mentioned. This is his last change of clothes. It's the one that he's robed in glory. Joseph is at the height of his power, far, you know, far beyond what his brothers... And it occurs to me, when his brothers saw him with that coat of many colors and he lauded his dreams before them, their thought, of course, is, who's this young punk? He's the youngest of us. He's uh, you know, the only child of Rachel at that point. And who is he to be exalting himself up like that Clearly, we're more important. We're the firstborn. We're, 
of greater importance than this pretender. At this point, that's not even in their mind, and we're going to see that as we continue going on. In their eyes, he is the great Lord and magistrate. He's, he's the one with the power. They don't recognize it. The transformation is so complete. He recognizes them. They don't recognize him. And the first point I wanted to make here, we're going to read a lot more of the story, but I wanted to stop here and, and point out, you know, some of us have had dreams, visions, or at least things that God has told us. You feel like you've heard from the Lord. And I want you to notice a contrast between Joseph's earlier dreams, his dreams, and then all the other dreams in this story. There's a lot of dreams in this story. Joseph is the interpreter of dreams. Right? You have the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer. They were given and realized within a space of days. Right? They, they both have a dream one night, and it says three days later, Pharaoh calls them up. And it comes to pass according to what Joseph had interpreted from, based on the dream. So those dreams... I see as warnings to those men. There wasn't anything they could do about it. It wasn't telling them, hey, this is going to happen, therefore you should take some action or do something different. It was just, this is, just be prepared. Be, be forewarned. For the cupbearer, it's have hope. You're about to be exalted and, re and removed and restored to your position. For the baker, it's be, <laughs> your end is coming. <laughs> you've got three days, you've got a little bit of time when Pharaoh's going to call you up and it's not going to go well, so just, just know. Just be prepared. That dream, like, meet your maker. Meet your maker. I mean, uh, you know, poor baker, man. Uh, you know, I, I like to think that the dream was more than just establishing Jacob's legitimacy as an interpreter of dreams. You know, I, I think God was speaking to the baker, but what a message for the baker. Uh, of course, he doesn't really tell us much about that, but I don't know if I want to be the baker. You know, I kind of like the not knowing when it's going to happen, you know. But the point is, those dreams were given and then fulfilled in a very short time frame. The dreams that were given to Pharaoh were warnings about the current state of the world and the imminent future that was about to happen. So that was God telling Pharaoh, look, you're going to have years of plenty, and then you're going to have years of famine, and obviously the purpose is do something about it. Now that you're forewarned, you can take action, you can change your behavior, you can prepare, you can... Uh, do something about the future that you wouldn't have been able to do ahead of time. And of course, again, God is using Joseph. So this is, this is clearly part of God's plan to preserve what will be the nation of Israel, to establish them in Egypt, and to use Joseph to do so. But again, very much topical, important to the time at hand. The dream comes, and immediately, as far as we know in Scripture, Pharaoh's like, okay, if that's what it means, then... Let's do something about it. Joseph proposes a solution, and Pharaoh says, sounds good to me, go do it. So the dream came with immediate effect. But Joseph's dreams weren't realized for 13 years. He had this dream, or more. We don't know exactly when he had the dreams. So they weren't given to tell Joseph about his immediate future or to inform him about current events so that he could take action. They were a promise to Joseph from God about who he would become. And I want us to remember that because we're going to touch on it when it comes back around. The dreams that God gave Joseph were not for then. And you could argue, should he, you know, we, I, think, I think David, you were the one who taught the first one. Was it wise of him to share those dreams to his brothers? As a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, young kid, about to be a man, you know, young man with these older brothers. Was it wise of him to tell them, hey, God told me, y'all are going to bow down and serve me? Maybe not, right? So, it, you know, those dreams weren't for then. They were for Joseph. All right, picking up in verse 9. Joseph remembered the dreams that he dreamed, and he said to them, You're spies. You've come to seek the nakedness of the land. You've come to, to, to find things out. And they said, No, your Lord. We've, we've only come to buy food. We're, we're all sons of one man. We're, we're honest men. Your servants have never been spies. Foreshadowing. Uh, as they come out of Egypt, you have 12 spies that come from these 12 men. I don't know. It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. It's just... So he said, no, it's the nakedness of the land that you've come to see. He said, no, we're, we're 12 brothers. We're sons of one man. Really, you can almost hear they're repeating themselves here, right? You can almost hear them desperately like, 
Why would you think we're spies? We're, we're dying of famine here. We, we came, our father sent us to get food. We live in Canaan. The youngest, we're, we're missing one of our brothers because he's with our father, and the other one's no more. Of course, Joseph keeps hammering on them. No, you're spies, and I'm going to test you. Unless you bring the youngest, I'm paraphrasing a bit for time, but you can follow along. Unless you bring the youngest brother here, I'm not going to let you leave. One of you go back, send one of you, let him bring your brother. The rest of you are going to remain confined that your words may be tested. If you're not spies, then what you tell me has got to be true. Bring your other brother. Otherwise, on a life of Pharaoh, I'll know you're spies. So he puts them all in custody for three days. And on the third day, he said to them, okay, I'll be nice. Do this instead and you'll live. If you're honest men, instead of all of you staying and one going, one of you stay and the rest of you go. Go back to your father. Bring the grain. Bring your younger brother to me. That way I'll know that you're telling the truth and you won't die. So they did. And this, we could spend a lot of time thinking about, but they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. All these years later, Joseph could be a forgotten problem that they dealt with, but no, it weighed on their heart. They knew what they had done. We are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. And that is why this distress has come upon us. We are being answered for the evil that we've done. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy, but you didn't listen? So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. And obviously they're saying this in their native language, and Joseph is speaking the native language of the court of Egypt so far. They haven't recognized him. They didn't realize that he understood them. And so he turned away and wept. And notice the, the attitude of Joseph here, because it strikes me the love he has for his brothers. The love he has for the brothers that did what, the worst to him. That were going to kill him and ultimately are the... You could... If it was me, okay? If, if it wasn't Joseph, if it was me, and I'm sitting there. These are the jokers that got me in this situation. When I'm in Potiphar's house in slavery, I'm angry and mad because I'm having to serve this man... When I should have been home with my father, I should have been <coughs> lord over my brothers with my father, I, sh I should have had an inheritance there, I should have been free and able to do what I want, but now I'm in bondage. But okay, I'm going to work hard, but I'm probably going to be pretty salty about it, and, you know, not, not particularly cheerful. Maybe I get to be elevated like Joseph was, then Potiphar's wife does what she does, and I'm going to be... I mean, a natural reaction would be to be very upset right. that... that now I'm in prison for what this horrible woman has, has lied on me about. And again, I'm thinking, those brothers of mine, man. <laughs> now I'm not just in slavery, now I'm in prison. But Joseph obviously hadn't thought that way about his brothers because he wept. He, he, it moved him. And he returned to them. It, it, you get the sense it was hard for him to be mean. Like he's trying to be the mean, or at least the tough uh, you know, Egyptian official who's dealing with these outsiders who are coming to buy grain, and he's given this impression that he's suspicious of them, so he's playing this front of, and it's hard, because his heart. So he returns to them, and he spoke, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes, and Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded up their donkeys with their grain. They departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, so they've gone a ways and they stopped for the night, and he's feeding his donkey. He sees the money, and he turns to his brother. My money's been put back here. It is in the mouth of the sack. And as their hearts failed them, at this their hearts failed them, they trembled, turning to one another, what, what is this that God has done? Like, remember, the, the words of Reuben are ringing in their ears. This is happening to us because of what we did to Joseph. And now this... This official who's holding Simeon and is requiring us to go get Benjamin to, get, to prove our... Like, now we've stolen all of his money. And we, we didn't pay for the grain. Or we've stolen the grain. We, we haven't paid for it. The money's still here. What are we going to do? They came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan. They told him all that had happened to them, saying, 
the man, the Lord of the land, he spoke roughly to us. He took us to be spies. We told him we're honest men. We've never been spies. We're brothers, sons of our one father. We have one brother who's gone and the younger one is with our father. He told us that we had to, 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 to test us, to, to know that we were honest. We had to leave one with him, bring the grain back, and bring the younger brother back to him. And they emptied their sacks, and behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. Now, I'll kind of pause here. Joseph obviously is, is testing them, but to some degree, uh, you know, they, all of them have changed over this 13-year period. They've all, uh, that, that experience with Joseph obviously was a, a watershed moment in his life. It was a life-changing event for Joseph, and it's defined him in many ways. But the same is true of his brothers. They've had to live with the choice of what they've done. They've had 13 years to think about it. The heat of the moment has passed. They've seen their father's grief. They've seen their father coming back to life with Benjamin as he grows, but there's this hole in their father's heart, and they can't help but talk about it here. We're missing a brother. And every time they say, we're missing a brother, they know the reason we're missing a brother is because we sold him into slavery. So Joseph is trying to get a read on their hearts and their minds and understand what kind of men are you now? But in a similar sense, I think God is, as he has been this whole time, getting a read on Joseph and having Joseph prove to himself, what kind of man are you, Joseph? Right. Are you going to stand up? How are you going to deal with these men, right. your brothers who should have loved you and hated you instead? Talk about a dysfunctional family. Yeah, I, I was remarking when um, we, were, we were on one of the previous ones I was just thinking about as we were talking through what happened here, I think it was Landon was the one who was presenting it, if I remember correctly, and I couldn't help but think, this feels like an old story, right? This is something we learned in Sunday school, a lot of us, and it's familiar. But in many ways, this is fresh and current. This is what our world does now. How many, how many families are there, there's one member that's estranged, and they've cut off the rest of them? And sometimes they're cut off because they have a whole bunch of mess and no one can deal with them. And we've tried and we love them, but they keep biting our hand. And we just, we've gotten to the point where we can't do anything. We, we, it hurts, but you've got to make choices. But a lot of times nowadays, it's the opposite. You have someone that's growing up in a family that's just so dysfunctional. The parents don't know how to teach their children how to love. The parents don't know how to show healthy love for each other, let alone their children. And some kids grow up, I know, because I've worked with some of them. They're like, I don't talk to my family. Like, I got to the point where I love my family, but I realized that if I wanted to be healthy, I had to cut them off. I couldn't, I couldn't have them in my life because they hurt me. And I, can't, I couldn't help but think about that when we're talking about Joseph here. What kind of... How, did that, how, does, how does that feel as Joseph? To know that the brothers that should have loved me hated me to the point that they were going to kill me and ultimately sold me into slavery because at least the oldest one had enough responsibility not to do so. And now we're back face to face. Now the connection has been remade. How's Joseph? Where's Joseph's heart? And what we're going to see is that his, you know, I said that, that moment ended up defining him, but I'd argue it, it wasn't the defining moment of Joseph's life. But these trials are for all of them. Let's continue. So they've ended 40, chapter 42. We're going to jump into chapter 43. They're back home, and they're afraid to go back, or, or Jacob doesn't want them to go back because they can't go back without Benjamin. And if you finish out, you know, J- Jacob didn't want them to go, doesn't want them to take Benjamin. If you take Benjamin, I'll have no sons left. I'll be bereaved. But Genesis 43 now the famine was severe in the land. And when they'd eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again and buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel, that's Jacob, said, Why did you treat me so badly? 
as to tell the man that you had another brother. Why did you tell him about Benjamin? What were you thinking? I love this because it's, it's, I could see this playing out. You know, they replied, look, look, he thought we were spies. He was grilling us on our life. He was asking us about our family. He was asking us why we were here. Like, he was trying to figure out who we are. We were immigration, and the immigration officer was going through the list. What's your purpose for being here? Who are you traveling with? It's like, what are we going to do? We didn't know that he was going to get all up about our brother. We didn't know he was going to do this. So we were just trying to be honest so he wouldn't take us as spies. Dad, why, why are you getting mad at us? He questioned us carefully. Verse 8, Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me. We will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have now returned twice. Now, obviously, this is one of the main points we can draw from this story is the, the incredible transformation in, in the, the brothers who previously, with the previous son of Rachel, which I'll, I'll kind of pause here and take a step back. Do you, do you not think that the animosity between the brothers and Joseph was partially a reflection of the animosity between Leah and Rachel? This didn't come from nowhere. This dysfunction didn't start from nowhere. This, this is this rivalry of these sisters who've been married by their father to the one man, and that's echoed. But now, the same, and Judah was not one, of, it was Reuben previously that said, don't kill him, just sell him into slavery. Right? When they put him in the pit and they were planning on killing him, Judah was not the one that said that. It was Reuben. But Judah is the one because his father's called him out. He's the one who has turned about and said, look, Dad, I'll, I'll keep Benjamin safe. The other brother of the same mother as Joseph, I'll keep Benjamin safe. And it, it'll be on me. I'll put myself in the way if I have to. Incredible change. I've also often wondered about this time span. Sarah, if you can pull up that image. Was it years was Simeon sitting in an Egyptian prison for years until they ran out of food? I don't know, as a kid, I, I thought it was a really long time. Like years. I don't know why I thought that. I just did it as a kid. Because sometimes you, you, you don't ask, you just make... Kids make things up in their head and they don't... You don't know what's in a kid's head until you ask them. It's amazing what we, what we think. But I thought it was a long time. Now the Bible doesn't give us a concrete time frame, but Judah mentions that they could have gone and come back twice in the time by verse 10. If we'd not delayed, if, we, if we'd gone straight back, we could have come and gone twice since then. So, I looked at the map, and I figured out the distance, and I did the math. If we assume, so this, this obviously up here in the, the right, that's Israel, this is modern day Israel. Um, that's the right dot is where modern day Hebron is, which is roughly the area we think that, that they were staying at the time. Uh, Egypt, of course, down here, this is the Nile Delta. Cairo's a little bit south of that. I'm not sure if that's where Pharaoh was at the time or if that's where Joseph had his, his post, you know, where he was posted. But somewhere in that Nile Delta is probably where Joseph was. So we're looking at about 200, 250. You know, this, this particular path is 240 miles. Some sources say that uh, like a caravan back in that time with camels or, or other donkeys, animals, could make anywhere between 10 to 20 miles a day. So if we take about a middle 15, 16 miles a day average of that, we're looking at, I'm going to look at my notes so I can not do the math, like two to three weeks, one way to do that 240 miles. So obviously he said there and back, so two ways is four to six weeks, and he said we could do it twice. So it was about two to three months that Simeon was in Egypt and that they were dallying and not going because their father was unwilling to send Benjamin. And... Um, of course, this is not exact, and I'm sure Judah wasn't being exact either. He's throwing out rough estimates, but maybe that gives us an, a rough idea of the time frame and the distances involved. Now, our family, we buy groceries weekly. <laughs> you know? Now, of course, it's not quite the same. I don't think they were buying fruits and meats, right? They weren't buying perishable things. They're buying grain that's going to keep for a long time. But still, I mean, it's a family of, you know, 10 brothers, 11 brothers, and the parents, and then, of course, you've got the rest of the, the whole caravan, the, the servants and the, the handmaidens and the, the tenders of the sheep, and it's not a small group. So I'm, I'm frankly kind of impressed they made it for like 
two to three months on the grain that they bought from one trip. Still, that's a lot of groceries. So that settles Jonathan's, little Jonathan will correct his thinking there. It wasn't years, but still was not a short time. Verse 11. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits. See, they've got perishables. They just don't have enough to sustain them. Take some of the choice fruits of the land. Carry a present to this man. A little balm, a little honey, gum, burr, pistachio, nuts, almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your stacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother. Arise, go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he send you back to your other brother in Benjamin. As for me, I am bere- if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Joseph, or Jacob realizes here, this is all of them. This is everything he's got left. But... Again, I don't know, as a kid, you learn this story, and it doesn't feel quite as much gravity as it is here. Like, this is, this is he is sending all of his descendants, his entire inheritance is riding on them getting this food from the grain here. And again, not knowing it's Joseph, this is an extremely daunting, I mean, I get frustrated when I have to call people on the phone, and, you know, I'm haggling with the credit card bureau because I disagree with something they've done. This is, they're going for a a bureaucrat, a lord, someone who has authority and doesn't care about them for the sake, you know, the, 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 this is their family on the line here. So, yeah. So the men took this present. They took double the money with them in Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, bring the men into the house, slaughter an animal, make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. The men did it as Joseph told them and brought them into Joseph's house. I'll skip through down here, but they bring the sacks. No, I don't want to skip down because I want to show you what he, how he responded. The men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house, and they said it's because of the money. We didn't get taken to the, the granary. We didn't get taken to the official position. We got taken to this guy's house. And, of course, his house is surely going to be a lavish. He's the second in command of the pharaoh. Taken to his house, they said it's because of the money which was replaced in our sack the first time that we were brought in. So the assault, he may assault us and fall on us and make us his servants and seize our donkeys. He's going to kill us. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house, spoke with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. When we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we brought it again with us and we've brought more money so that we can buy food. We did not know who put the money in our sacks. And he said, Peace to you, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put your treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. That's an interesting response, isn't it? That um, this they would respond, No, God blessed you. He put the money in your sacks. I got I got your money. You paid for it. This is just a blessing of God. I don't know exactly what to do with that response, but how how does that make them feel? So he brought him into, the, into Joseph's house. And if I understand the scripture right, this isn't Joseph saying this, this is the steward saying this to them. This is the steward telling them, we got your money, Joseph obviously credited it to them. You just got blessed somehow, God, God blessed you. When he brought them into Joseph's house, he gave them water, he'd washed their feet. When he gave them their donkey's fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. They thought he's going to give him, he's going to take care of them, they're going to eat some bread, they're going to, get on the way and, and go, they don't realize that he's preparing a feast for them. Joseph comes home. He brings them into the house. They give him their present, and they bow down again on the ground. And he asked about their father. He's well. Is this your youngest brother whom he spoke of? God be gracious to you, my son. He's watching how they're going to treat Benjamin, right? Joseph hurried out. For his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered in his chamber and wept there. He sees Benjamin, who, again, how could you feel about this? How could you feel about this? What most of us would feel is resentful, right? I was the son of Rachel that my brothers tormented to the point of trying to kill me. And then... My younger brother, Benjamin, 
they're treating... Why? Okay, so for, for him you'll be nice, but for me you are going to kill me. So you're going to be... Why didn't I get the treatment you're now getting for him? Not that necessarily I want him to be mistreated, but, but all that does when I see you treat him so nicely is remind me of how horribly you treated me, and I was no different than him. Why do you treat me this way? But that's not how Joseph feels. What he feels is compassion for Benjamin. I know where you went, and I'm so happy that your story is different than mine. Then he served him by himself, and them by themselves. And the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. We, we glance over that. It's not the point of this lesson, but there's a reason they settle in Goshen, not amongst the Egyptians. And it's not because the Hebrews wanted to be separate. It's because the Egyptians were like, those Hebrew nomads that, no. They're, anyways, we'll, we'll go on. I don't have time to touch on all that. They sat before him, the, first, the firstborn according to his birthright, the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. And for the sake of time, unfortunately, I'm going to jump through a lot of the rest of the story, but y'all may know it, and it picks back up in chapter 44. He puts food back in their sack as much as they can possibly carry. He puts the money back in their sack again, and then he hides his personal cup in Benjamin's bag, and he sends it with them. So the first time they come, and he's gruff and suspicious and treats them like spies and doubts everything they say, and they leave afraid because he's holding one of them hostage, and they're pretty sure when they come back he's going to kill them because that's the kind of guy he's made himself out to be. I don't trust these Hebrews. I don't trust these, these and now they've stolen my money. And, but this time it's different. This time they come, and he's lavishly welcoming them with this incredible food and feast, and he's making a, a show of their younger brother that they brought, that he should be giving him honor, and he explicitly told him, bless you, and again, like, assume, imagine we're sitting down with the governor or, or, or you know, the, the vice president or some high-up official, and this is the experience we're having. Again, they leave, and they again discover, I don't know which is worse, that you have the guy who's suspecting me of being a spy and I've stolen his money, or you have the guy that just you know, was so kind and nice and, and, and welcomed us in and obviously trusted us and gave us the benefit of the doubt, and now we've stolen his money and his cup, his personal cup. And of course, y'all probably heard this before, but it's not an accident that Joseph puts it in Benjamin's back. Because again, I think he's wanting to know, like, how do you really feel about Benjamin? Okay, you're, you're nice to Benjamin when I ask you to bring him, but now that he's gone, if he's the problem, if he's the one who stole the cup, if he's the one who's making a mess and getting you all in trouble, now how are you going to behave to him? Are you still going to be kind to him? And of course, the response is Judah is good to his word. They, they follow after them, they find them, they search the bags, they find the cup, they accuse them of being so rude against his hospitality, they bring them back, This would have been the chance for them to get rid of Benjamin too. The, the, the perfect opportunity. He, he did it. He, it's his fault. He, he's the troublemaker. It was even better than Joseph because Joseph was just arrogant. But Benjamin has stolen the cup. The, the Lord's cup. But, of course, Judah is, does what he says. He told to his father he would. And he puts himself in front of his brother and says, Take me. Don't take Benjamin if you take Benjamin, my father's going to die. It's his, the child of his youth that he loves, and he, he can't, if, if you take him, my, my father's his, he's going to be pulled down to the place of, of the dead. We can't go without him. So they bring him back. And we're going to jump ahead to, to chapter 45, and we'll finish here for today. And we'll see what else we want to talk. Because I want to come back to that thought about dreams. And then we may, we may spend next week in having read through the story, talked through some of this as well. Actually, let's, let's, uh, Sarah, can you go to chapter 44, uh, start in verse 30. This is Judah's response. Now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life, as my father's life is bound up 
in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to shield, place of the dead. For our servant became a pledge of safety for the boy, your servant, to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all the life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain. This is Judah speaking. Let me stay instead of the boy as a servant. I'll, I'll serve you. I'll be here. Wh whatever you want. Let the boy go back with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood before him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Of course, his brothers couldn't answer him. They're not overjoyed at this reunion. They're, they're scared out of their minds. Joseph's going to kill us. Now I understand why he's been doing everything he's doing. And now he's got us alone. And uh, Reuben was right. That thing we did is coming down on our head. But Joseph said, come near to me, please. And they came near. I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. What an incredible thing for Joseph to say. For Joseph to say. I'm, I'm, I was trying to think of a way to put this into modern, our thoughts, but it's like the guy, the guy that, that hits me and gets me in an accident. It's on my mind because Sister Tanya Ross, and I'm thankful that she's doing well, as I understand, and God will be with her and heal. But what an incredible, I mean, to then come and say, look, it's your fault. You did it. You hit me. You should have been paying attention. You should have, blah, blah, blah. Don't be upset with yourself anymore. It'd be one thing for Brother Gossett to go find that guy and tell him. Well, he's a pastor. He's a preacher. He's supposed to help us to forgive ourselves. But the person that they threw in the pit, the person that they sold, he's the one telling them, you know, I'm the one who has the right to be angry with you for what you did. But what I'm choosing to tell you is don't be angry with yourselves because of what you did to me. Because you meant it for evil. You sold me here. But God sent me before you to preserve your life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over the land of Egypt. Now, I'm at our time, so I don't want to go too much deeper. In Romans, Paul said, we know that, this is Romans 8, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Those dreams, was it necessary that Joseph be sold into slavery to accomplish the purpose of God? Was it necessary that his brothers would betray him so? What would have happened if Joseph hadn't boasted of his dreams? If he, if he just kept quiet, would his brothers still have thrown him in the pit because he was still the favorite, he still had the coat of many colors, he was still the one that dad loved, and, and they still were bitterly jealous of him? I don't know. I don't know. It seems to me that one of the things that we can draw from the story of Joseph is that when God gives you a vision or calling telling you who you are, about who you will become, it's not in anyone else's power to take that out of your future. I think Joseph would have ended up in Pharaoh's house even if things had gone differently earlier. But it is Joseph himself who said it was the plan of God that put me there. It was the hand of God that sent me into slavery. It was the hand of God that put me in the prison. It was the hand of God that brought me to Pharaoh. He saw his journey as the result of the acts of God. Now, we don't get a lot of internal dialogue about characters in the Bible. Sometimes we just get a note, like when the Bible talks about hardening Pharaoh's heart, or, or I'm thinking of like when Judas was grumpy about the money that was wasted by uh, the woman who was anointing Jesus with, the oil, with precious oil, and, and John writes a note, right, looking back. He didn't say that because he was actually upset. He said it because he was robbing and he was 
So occasionally, but normally we don't, we don't see the internal thoughts. But I have to imagine that there were times along the way that Joseph, at least in his mind, railed against the unfairness of the situation. You don't think he got upset when he was being taken away? You don't think he got upset when Potiphar's wife lied about him and put him in prison? But I don't think that that being sold into slavery or being kicked out of Potiphar's house or being put into prison, I don't think any of those were defining moments in Joseph's life. I think the defining moment in Joseph's life was when God gave him a dream. And I think when he was in slavery, he had to think, God told me this. And it was evidently such an incredible experience. Joseph believed that dream. It wasn't just something he thought, oh, that's a cool idea. But he knew this was from God. This is who God called me to be. And so I believe when he's in slavery, the reason he acts well, the reason he does the right thing, the reason that Potiphar trusts him because he has his integrity is because he's living up to what God said. I know who God told me I am. The reason that he's in the prison and is a model prisoner to the point where the warden makes him his personal assistant and he has all this freedom and access when he could have been angry and lashing out is because in his mind he remembers what God told me. And he gets to the end, and now, looking back, he can connect all the dots. He says, I know who I am. I know who God called me to be. Yes. And we might talk about this more next week. Because how could Joseph be Joseph, have what he had, the understanding he understood, without the path that he traveled? I don't know. But what I do know this morning is, when God gives you a, a vision, when God gives you a calling, when God tells you who you are or who you will be, it's not always for right now. You don't always see the fulfillment right now. But it's so you have a landmark in your mind so that when you're going through life and things look like, is this where I want to be? I can still look up and I remember what God told me. I'm, I'm a slave in Potiphar's house, but I remember the promise that God gave me. I'm in prison, but I remember this bowing down. And Joseph clearly remembered it because when his brothers came and bowed down, this, that was it. That was what I saw. Now I know why I'm here. God sent me here to save my family. They, they meant to kill me, but God sent me here. They didn't send me here. God sent me here to save my family. Praise the Lord. We're going to take a few minutes here, and we're going to transition. But I want you to take this thought with you. When God calls you, he does so not always for today, but the promises of God are true. The only people I'm convinced that could have changed the outcome for Joseph are God if he changed his mind, and he doesn't, or Joseph if he lost sight and decided it's not worth it, I don't believe it, I don't care. But he held on, he followed God. We'll talk about it more next week, I think, but praise the Lord. We're wrapping up Joseph. We're going to take a few minutes in transition here. Don't forget who God has told you you are, even if life tells you differently. Amen.